Welcome. Hi, everyone. Today, we are honored to have with us Marcus Watkins, Overseas Director for Space Communication and Operations at NASA. Marcus is an engineer and has a long career in various programs such as Discovery, Explorers, and Sounding Rapids. Good morning, Marcus. Uh, we are here to talk about a crucial topic such as sustainability, the importance of recycling, and how glass and technology can help us achieve a greener and more responsible future. Welcome, Marcus. Thank you. Glad to be here. So it's amazing to be here with you today. Um, I really wanted to talk about, um, you know, in the space explorations, um, the use of glass and technology, because I know you are very, you know, concerned about all of this, but how is glass uh, used in, in space? Astronauts and human beings want to be able to see things. So the first use of glass in space is tied to windows, right? Windows so that astronauts can actually look at and learn from what they see, looking at our incredible planet from the orientation of space versus what we have historically seen when we look up into the sky. But there are a multitude of applications for glass in space. In addition to windows, which again, it's this very special type of glass that we utilize, uh, thermal glass, which it has to be capable of going through massive changes in temperature. Because again, on planet Earth, um, you know, you're looking at pressures that are about 14.7 pounds per square inch. But when you get up in space, there's very little pressure there. Uh, the, uh, the other difference is just temperature gradations. And so temperature can vary a great deal. And with glass, you've got to be able to maintain and sustain yourself. So thermal glass comes into play with respect to windows. There are several layers of glass. In addition to that, we like to utilize uh, power generating devices such as photovoltaic cells, uh, so solar cells. And so the cover of a solar cell or photovoltaic is also a thin layer of glass. Uh, we have telescopes in space like uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb Space Telescope. And then with a variety of sensors uh, to uh, help our understanding of what we are seeing and to be able to actually provide data for uh, scientists and for people to utilize. Uh, we use glass as a hermetic seal over a lot of our sensors. So those are just a few of the uh, applications uh, for glass and its utilization in space. So space explorations is often perceived as something really far from the problems here on the Earth. So how do you see the relationship between space explorations and how to contribute uh, for a more sustainable uh, life on the Earth. Space gives us a wonderful uh, uh, place to actually study our own planet, Earth, right? And so a lot of space exploration is tied to getting a greater awareness of our own planet, whether we're talking about weather, whether we're talking about the ability to actually monitor what's happening on our Earth, greenhouse gas effects, uh, rises in uh, sea surface temperature. When I think of space exploration and I think of sustainability overall, I think that they go hand in hand. It's better to, uh, to be thinking about how one is going to sustain things for the future, for our children, for our grandchildren. And NASA's always been on the forefront of space sustainability. There have been policies and practices that have been enacted uh, clearly so that we can limit the amount of debris in Earth orbit. And going forward, space is getting busier and busier. And so it's important to have agreements not only with uh, space agencies around the world, uh, but also with commercial entities as well as private companies so that we are not putting clutter into space. The good news is that uh, space agencies, countries, as well as commercial companies are all concerned about uh, space sustainability. And just this year, NASA uh, in April announced a, uh, a new strategy towards uh, space. So as far as I know, international collaboration is crucial to addressing global challenges. So could you please share uh, how NASA collaborates with other agencies or organizations to address uh, the sustainability? Going back to the, the early 1960s and beyond, uh, this has been something that we have always uh, engaged with and, and talked with. And as 
there have been an increase of uh, space agencies across the world, the European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, South Africa has a space agency, Spain has a wonderful space agency. Um, we engage both agency to agency, but we also uh, engage uh, from you know, country to country. And the things that we talk about, since again, space in our understanding is, is for all of humanity. So in that regard, we humanity, humans need to work together to, uh, to ensure sustainability. So we engage with space agencies uh, directly uh, as well as commercial companies uh, to ensure that as we are looking at exploring and understanding our planet and the universe, that we are doing this in a very collaborative fashion. And so NASA has helped with uh, its use of standards that have ultimately been adopted by others. And now uh, we're looking at, again, this international consortium of, of space agencies and others to work on sustainability as we begin to go further uh, into space, going back to the moon, and ultimately with further exploration, whether it be celestial bodies, uh, discovering uh, more about our planet and our solar system and ultimately our universe. Amazing. Arrived to this point, I want to talk about a topic I am really interested in. Recycling and the space. What a curious combination, isn't it? It is. So tell me, Marcus, is it possible to recycle that glass? Glass that goes into space uh, is basically utilized, again, whether it be for sensors or windows and things of that nature. If glass is going into space, it needs to be contained, right? So the worst thing you could, you would want to have happen in a zero G or, uh, environment would be to have a break, right? And particles of glass uh, with astronauts or at the International Space Station and other things. So when glass is up there, it is usually contained. There was an interesting um, mission back w uh, when we were flying uh, the space shuttle with Discovery, and it was glass in a bottle. They took a container. Uh, that uh, was covering the glass, and they opened it to space, and so they actually were able to bring back space, and then they brought it back down to Earth, um, and they asked for people to send messages, like messages in a bottle, associated with uh, what they were thinking about with respect to the universe, and uh, and so that was one of the cool things that happened in 2011. And now there's another message in a bottle that's occurring with the Europa mission, which is going to go to the icy moons of Jupiter, where um, uh, basically should be launched on October 10th, but there was an effort, and you could sign up to send your name uh, kind of uh, with a message in a bottle on that mission. And so they ultimately etched it on a microchip about the size of a dime, and that'll be going up on October 10th uh, to Jupiter and the icy moons. Well, that is certainly a challenge. And by the way, since we are talking about technology and glass, do you know the technological uses of this material in question? On every spacecraft that we build, or if, it, if we're going to the moon, or if we're going to uh, one of the other planets, there are a wide variety of sensors, depending on what the mission is and the information that one wants to bring back. And so glass is used, again, on so many different sensors. Uh, glass is used, uh, you know, again, with respect to uh, power generating solar cells and things of that nature. And so the, the use of glass, I expect, will expand, whether it be tied to telescopes uh, and, and other applications. Uh, but ultimately, we want to make sure that in addition to glass, that we have sustainability, that we are limiting the amount of debris that is actually in orbit around our planet, and that we are not contaminating the rest of the universe uh, as we begin to explore and push the boundaries of science and knowledge. Well, that's all right. So I think it's clear to say that NASA is not only looking towards space, but also towards how we can improve our lives here on the Earth. Absolutely. Uh, and again, at the end of the day, we are, at this point in time, humanity is all that we know about. Uh, and it's important for us to make sure that we understand our planet, that we understand what's happening to our planet, so that we can plan accordingly to sustain ourselves uh, here on Mother Earth, and uh, so space, our understanding, again, is all part of, I think, the big picture, where they're all connected, and our discoveries, our expansion of learning, of knowledge tied to physics, tied to how things simply work in our universe, can have direct applications back here on Earth, and, and, and that's why I think 
uh, human beings have always sought to explore and will always seek to explore. It's imperative that we increase our understanding and our knowledge. So think about that. I mean, we only understand, you know, perhaps less than 1% or maybe as much as 5% of what's actually going on in the universe. And so I don't believe we are alone, uh, but, I, but for right now, uh, it appears that uh, we haven't been in contact or found any other sources of life. But I do think that within uh, my lifetime and most definitely uh, the folks tying, tying into this uh, conversation, we will discover life. There are billions and billions of galaxies, billions and billions of planets, and so are we alone? I don't think so. It's a pleasure to talk about these important topics and how what may look like a simple gesture like glass recycling can help us achieve a more sustainable future. And to all of you, thank you for joining us. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you very much.